Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Fantastic to see a full house at the start of term. Um, tonight we're going to be thinking about unrequited love. Um, so I'll start by introducing our speakers and then we will have a bit of a conversation amongst the panel and there'll be lots of time for you to ask any questions that you might have. So our speakers this evening are Ulrika Carlson, who is Assistant Professor in Philosophy at the National Research University Higher School of Economics, Russia. Erin Plunkett, who is a teaching fellow in philosophy at Royal Holloway University of London, and Stephen Gross, who is a psychoanalyst and an author. And you can buy his fantastic book, The Examined Life, outside. Uh, so I think we'll start with you, Alwika. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about unrequited love. What, what is it and why should we care about it? Well, unrequited love, can you hear me? Um, is when you love someone or you're in love with someone and they're not interested or they don't love you back. And typically, I guess we talk about it usually in the romantic context, but there's no reason not to uh, include also friendship and love between parents and children and siblings. Um, and the, since we're focused on the suffering, so it can involve a few different kinds of suffering. First of all, just uh, you know, loneliness. It can be a, a source of loneliness. Uh, it uh, can deprive you of all the good things that might come from a mutual loving relationship. Uh, but in addition to that, um, there's something about unrequited love that feels like an insult. Um, uh, because you, um, you, you want a certain kind of recognition, a certain kind of affirmation from another person, and you don't receive it. Um, but what's, well, one of the things that are interesting for me about it is that although it feels like an insult and it can make you feel uh, humiliated, you can get angry uh, the way you would if somebody insulted you, uh, uh, because the person hasn't actually done anything wrong, it's very difficult to discharge that emotion in any kind of response to them. So you can't really, um, uh, you can't accuse them of anything. You can't, you know, uh, exact revenge. Uh, and so it's the kind of suffering that easily sort of, you know, turns inward into a kind of self-loathing uh, and becomes uh, well, builds up and becomes, turns into bitterness. Um, that's one, yeah, that's one of the things that I think are interesting about it, the fact that, um, or let me say, as a, someone who works in philosophy, it's interesting that uh, mostly in philosophical ethics, people tend to focus on uh, talking about things that are morally wrong. Uh, and there's some kind of idea that if only we all uh, followed, you know, you know, did what we did the right thing all the time, uh, if we could get everyone to, you know, follow uh, the moral law or whatever, then there would be no suffering in the world, except maybe suffering caused by diseases and natural disasters and so on. And so, the for me, the one of the big philosophical lessons of unrequited love is that, um, or what it sort of represents is that uh, you could have a perfect moral utopia, a world in which everyone always did the right thing, and still it could be completely miserable because it could be the case that all these people were in love with people who didn't love them back. And it's not something that you can uh, do away with, you know, with technology or with science or with uh, morality or with a perfectly just uh, political system, 
it's just a kind of uh, uh, a misfortune that is very difficult to do away with. Um, yeah. Is there something we can learn from it then? Uh, as individuals who are well, not loved or yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, well, I think the, the most important lesson to learn from it is that sort of you need to have uh, uh, what I think of as a sense of tragedy in your approach to life, which means that you need to be uh, sort of prepared to be resigned to the fact that there, there, there's, there's um, terrible things that are going to happen to you, probably, that you can't do anything to prevent. Um, you can't, not, n again, not in any, you know, not with any technology, but also not even if, you know, if everyone had, you know, a goodwill and always acted in goodwill. You still couldn't prevent it. And so we're still sort of uh, all at the mercy of other people's uh, not just their goodwill, but we're at the mercy of other people's taste, other people's feelings, which is something they themselves can control. Um, and so what you have to sort of brace yourself for when you go into life is this completely unavoidable, uh, terrible pain of, of not, being, uh, not being wanted by, um, by someone that you love. So it's better to accept that than to fight it, is that what you're saying? Well, how would you fight it? Uh, I mean, the, the question is, you know, how, the question is, you know, how long should you dwell on it? I mean, that's the kind of, uh, that, that's the question. Uh, and, and then there's the question, you know, should you, is it an occasion for you to, um, uh, you know, is it an occasion for like self-improvement or, you know, should you, should you not take it too seriously? Should you not, uh, sh you know, should you try to figure out why you're not loved or not? Um, yeah. I was really interested in what you said at the beginning about thinking about unrequited love in other contexts than the romantic. Because I think as soon as we all saw the title of the event, the, the default is to think about romantic love. I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I think um, in the case of parents and children, there are many more people who would say that, like, parents have an obligation to love their children. Um, I don't think that they do, but I think maybe they have an obligation to pretend to love their children, and to, <laughs> to go through all the motions of love towards their children. Um, but... Um, I suppose I, I would think that if you're a child who's not doesn't feel loved by their parents, there's um, the the sort of the hurt feelings, the the insult part might be less uh, might be less of a problem for you, and the bigger problem will be this enormous sense of uh, kind of uh, loneliness and abandonment uh, in the world. Um, which in a way, uh, in a way might be a feeling that some people have, that some people walk around with all their lives even if they were loved by their parents. I mean, in some sense, the feeling of having been uh, the feeling of abandonment, I think, is something that you can have, uh, you know, even if, even if you are, like, in, even if you were a, a loved child. Um, like, I think the, the, the moment when, uh, when Jesus cries on the cross to his father, why have you abandoned me, is so, so in a way, the, the reason it's powerful is that it somehow expresses the feeling of, uh, uh, of abandonment and loneliness that, that for s at least for some people I think is like their kind of basic existential feeling of being in the world. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you've got any questions for Ulrika at this stage. <laughs> Could you wait until the microphone gets to you? Hi there. Um, 
you, you were talking about uh, the negative uh, aspects of, of unrequited love, you know, and, and the pain and the, and the suffering and the loneliness. What about, what about the positive, productive aspects of it? Um, you know, it can be, it can be a force for, for literary creation. It can be, you know, it can drive someone like Catullus to write poems about lesbia, and you know, it can be. It, it, you, you can derive things from from uh, uh, from that that, are, yeah. that can be positive as well. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think actually my uh, my fellow speakers, I have a feeling, are going to focus more on the positives. Um, but I especially like um, that you mentioned, you know, literary uh, or any kind of, I guess, artistic uh, creativity as a kind of um, something, yeah, something through which you channel your these uh, emotions. Um, I'm, I, but I don't know, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I think the other good point, well, I mean, aside from the question whether it makes you grow and whether it makes you, uh, you know, more complete or more self-aware or whatever, I, you know, w once in a while, like, I've met people who claim that they've never, that they've never experienced unrequited love. Like, they've never, they've always, you know, just been lucky. Like, whenever they were in love, it was reciprocated. And I always, I mean, apart from, you know, I mean, I, you know, you feel great contempt for such people, obviously, <laughs> because they're, it's, uh, they're obviously not somehow a complete human being. I mean, they must, they still <laughs> believe that they're, they must believe that they're divine or something. I mean, there's, there's something, there's some crucial experience of, about being, you know, a finite creature who didn't, who, who didn't choose, you know, how to look, what kind of body to have, what kind of personality to have, what kind of temperament to have, what kind of, you know, how smart to be, how, what kind of psychological hang-ups to have, right? That's who we are. We're, we don't choose how to, you know, our, we don't choose who we are. Uh, and so it's, um, it's as, a, as part of be, being aware of that, that that's what it is to be a human being, the feeling of not being loved, of sort of not being, you know, to the other's uh, liking, not not appealing to the taste of the other, um, is sort of a, a, I think a kind of crucial experience for, yeah, for become for sort of knowing what it you know what it is to be a human being. Should we take one more question before we move on? The gentleman over there, he had his hand up first. Um. Regarding the moral utopia full of um, um, folk who are engaged in unrequited love, what would you say to the claim that um, these people are lacking wisdom and in a true utopia there would not be people who persist in love that was not returned? Uh, thanks. I think, well, for sure it's not a true utopia. Um, what it shows is that, you know, by, by just perfecting ourselves morally, we can't achieve a utopian society, a perfect society. Um, as far as not dwelling on your feelings, I mean, you know, there, there are some things, I mean, there are some feelings that it would be, it would feel better if you could just at will decide not to have them, but the question is, what kind of person would you have to be in order to be capable of doing that? Because, I mean, you know, just like grief is organically related to love uh, so that, you know, you can't, uh, if you lose someone that you love, then you naturally feel grief and it's not obvious that you could have the one without the other. Uh, and so I think, um, you know, a little bit of, of like, uh, of heartache is like, uh, and a little bit of dwelling on it isn't uh, isn't so bad, and can maybe even be good, and is probably just a necessary consequence of of our like emotional uh, constitution. I think. Okay, let's take one more question before we move on. Lady at the front. Hi. Do you think we can explain religion on unrequited love on this? 
was fucked up? You mean the, the, the reason that there's religion is because people don't feel loved? No, like, like they can love a, you know, a god in whatever sense without asking something back. Ah. Uh, well, what I would say is, well, there are probably a lot of people who feel loved in return by God in some way, even though from the outside you might, you know, people who don't believe in God might think that that's uh, strange or somehow a delusion. Um, but in, in the philosophical literature, I can say uh, people, you know, the love of, of God has often been sort of considered the, the greatest form of love beca precisely because it's supposed to be uh, not asking for anything in return. It's just a pure kind of, you know, also like Christian love of neighbor is supposed to be this love that doesn't care if it's uh, requited or not. It's just uh, all kind of about giving and it doesn't want anything in return. Thanks. Perhaps we could then come back to this idea of the positive side of unrequited love. Is unrequited love something we should be looking for? Is it good in some way? Is it philosophically good? We don't have to look for it. Um, you're probably going to encounter it. Uh, yes, I mean, um, within the history of philosophy, at least since Plato, Unrequited love is seen as um, a kind of uh, spur toward spiritual development, intellectual development, moral development. Um, the model of love in, in Plato's work, The Symposium, is, um, is one in which your desire for the other person takes place in this story of, this larger story of desire um, that leads past any kind of um, satisfaction toward transcendence, toward love of, of the good itself, beauty itself. Um, and so the way the story is told there, uh, Alcibiades, who's a lover of Socrates, is um, bursts in at the end of this, this banquet, uh, drunk and accuses Socrates of having seduced him and led him on, um, but refusing to sleep with him. So he, he's tried every trick in the book after Socrates kind of fans the flames of desire. He tries every trick in the book to get Socrates to sleep with him. Now Alcibiades is this beautiful, vain uh, young man, very popular. And um, so to imagine him in the position of a sort of crawling um, lover trying to get Socrates' affections is quite funny. But uh, he, he accuses Socrates of having, of having seduced him, and uh, he says now he can, he can no longer be satisfied with his way of life um, because he feels ashamed of how he used to live, uh, going for the glory of, of, of the many. And this, what we kind of take away from Alcibiades, I think, is um, is a recognition that the frustration that he um, experiences as a result of having his um, plans interrupted, um, not having his physical advances returned, um, is something that can potentially lead him to a to sort of higher plane of understanding about about himself and about what goods really are in the world. So. Um, and I think you don't need philosophy to tell you that, that frustration or a break or a breakup um, is a significant moment in the development of self because it, it suggests that the world doesn't correspond to your demands, to your picture of how things are. Um, and it introduces anxiety, as Kierkegaard describes it, um, a sense of rejection. Uh, and it brings, in Kierkegaard's picture, and he's interested in the Socratic picture as well, um, it takes you from a kind of childlike, um, a place of spiritual child, child, um, childishness, childishness, bleh, childishness into, um, into a mode of anxiety. And for Kierkegaard, the more anxiety you have, the more conscious you are. So it's this stage of, of development. And 
Um, so we think, we think at the end of symposium that Alcibiades has kind of started to learn this lesson uh, since he feels now ashamed of the way he used to live. Um, although, well, I'll talk more about that um, later on as well. We can, we can question the kind of um, seduction model um, if, in fact, erotic love does take part in this larger narrative of, of eros, of desire, um, that includes moral development and intellectual development, that it seems like the seducer would actually be the model lover because unrequited love, love that's not returned, um, automatically kind of gets spiritualized, right? Because the object of your love, since you can't have them in the flesh, as it were, um, they turn into a kind of ideal for you. Um, and of course, projection is a real danger there. Um, but unrequited love then becomes um, this, this, this um, mechanism by which we can, we can sort of uh, turn inward um, and also find um, higher goods or higher objects of affection um, than, than you know, the imperfect other person. So that's the, that's the beginning of the story anyway. <laughs> so it's not that unrequited love is a good in itself, it's that what it does to us and our subjective development is potentially a good. Yeah, I mean, um, certainly there are plenty of examples, um, especially 18th and 19th century literature of, of lovers who, who don't have their love returned um, simply committing suicide. So that's also a possibility. Um, and there's no guarantee that one will develop in a positive sense, as you mentioned, you know, bitterness is is, is also a, just as much of a of a possibility. Um, but I think, yeah, thinking about it philosophically, um, we need these breaks. We need these breaks in our kind of unity of the self in order to um, have the potential for development. And you can see that in in literature too, like. Um, um, there's a wonderful example of the, the possibility for, for kind of moral development, spiritual development um, in unrequited love in uh, Henry James's Wings of the Dove. So Millie Teal is this uh, the rich American heiress who uh, comes to, to Europe and is traveling. She meets, um, she meets Merton Densher and Kate Croy. Um, who are secretly engaged all the while, but um, she doesn't know that. She falls in love with Densher, and in the meantime, discovers that she has this um, incurable disease that will kill her sometime in the near future. So she's kind of facing her own mortality. And what she wants um, is to love. And she, she loves Densher. She falls in love with Densher. And even though she kind of has intimations about um, him and Kate being together. She becomes friends with both of them. She kind of pursues her relationship with him. And um, when, at the end of the book, she finally discovers that, um, oh, I should mention before I go on, that this kind of discovery of her mortality is the first break for her. And James has a wonderful description of it that I think um, we can have an analogy with, with unrequited love. Uh, the beauty of the bloom had gone from the small, old sense of safety. That was distinct. She had left it behind forever. But the beauty of the idea of a great adventure, a big, dim experiment or struggle in which she might more responsibly than ever take a hand had been offered her instead. So that's when she learned she's dying. Um, but there's kind of a similar um, awakening when, in her loving, she discovers that, in fact, she's been deceived um, the entire time. Densher and, and Kate love each other. She discovers this at the end of the book. Um, and yet, despite the, the evidence of her senses and um, of the person who tells her this is going on, she still chooses to love Densher and forgives him. and. It's all very obscure because it's James, so you never really know entirely what's, what's being said or what's going on, but 
he feels from their last meeting before she dies, he feels um, blessed and forgiven by this, um, by this woman. And so she comes off kind of the best of the whole lot um, in this series of very morally ambiguous characters and relationships. Because her love, um, unlike Kate who's, and Densher, who are kind of um, vying for the, for the money, but also like Millie, um, so it's, it's not totally straightforwardly evil or anything like that. Um, she, she experiences real love. Um, she doesn't need Denter to love her in return. She um, chooses to stake her belief on him even though she, it goes against her evidence. Um, and that's a, that's a kind of triumph of devotion that we see in unrequited love. That's another aspect of potential um, sort of good or development that, come, that can come from it. Uh, because the sheer devotedness to something that isn't um, realizable with infinitude, that kind of goes beyond finite circumstances, um, can itself be edifying. And Kierkegaard describes this wonderfully in a, his model of infinite resignation, which is um, a man who falls in love with a princess or something. Um, and she, um, the love isn't, isn't returned or can't be realized uh, between the two of them. And yet he holds on to this love, um, refuses to let it go, and kind of inwardly always renews this loving, even though he renounces the possibility of ever getting, getting the princess. So uh, that devotion, that kind of holding to, um, is another aspect of, that's important, I think, in the dynamic of unrequited love. Because you never really, it's not like unrequited love is the end of the relationship. You, you dwell on it, you know, in Kierkegaard's um, story of, uh, of, of Faust's lover, Gretchen. You know, she's, she's always going in her mind, he loves me, he loves me not, she can't decide. So that's a way of keeping the relationship alive, to refuse to say, he never loved me or she never loved me, but to always kind of renew the possibility that you were loved. It seems as if we have a variety of possibilities then. When, when we experience unrequited love, we can either turn to bitterness, we can either turn to self-development, we can do some other philosophical things. How do we choose? How do we, how do we make sure we're, we're picking the kind of path of development rather than bitterness and inwardness? And I don't know how you choose. I don't know how to give somebody instructions for how to choose, but oh. I think that how you choose, what you do, will will just say a lot about who you are. Is all I can say. Um, yeah. Um, so you're saying that something about what kind of person you are is exposed when you encounter this kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah, and then I think. Uh, a little bit of bitterness is, uh, a is it, uh, flattering for you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Irene, can you tell me what to do? Ah, uh, well, um, let's see. <laughs> Read philosophy, consolations of philosophy. <laughs> no, I, um, I think what, what your response is depends in part on how you view um, relationships with others in the first place, because if you know, if you have a, a certain respect for um, the separateness of the other person from you, um, that the other person is essentially alone in their freedom and so are you, um, then, you know, there's, there's, you can come to the, to the recognition that, um, you know, the other person is not responsible for, for my loving. Um, and I think while that can be of extremely frustrating experience because it's, it's, as you said, it's not as though the other person has done something wrong in that instance. Um, I think maybe that, that recognition is a, is, is a way to, to move forward, that there's a certain amount of freedom um, in our separateness to one another that has to, be, that has to be respected. But that's an intellectual solution that can't, can't <laughs> necessarily sway the emotions should we take some more questions? Uh, so there's a question there and then one at the back. 
Hi, I'd like to ask um, a more basic question because I don't come from philosophy background. Um, so what is the definition of love here? Is it an action or a noun? And from the discussion, I still don't get it whether it's um, a desire to have other person love us or is it trust or is it devotion? Thank you. Um, well, I think it can be all those things. I mean, traditionally, the, pl the platonic um, idea of desire is, is um, so eros desire is based on lack. So you want, you desire what you don't have. Um, so that can play out within a romantic relationship. You want the other person, or it can be, you know, wanting food or drink, or wanting to be good or beautiful or whatever. Um, so it's a very, it's a generic kind of term, and love is just one example of it. Um, but that's the, the logic of Eros, is that it's based on, on lack. Um, in terms of, like, does it mean that you want the other person to love you back? I mean, that's, I guess that's <laughs> part of the question. Like, if you, <coughs> does loving entail that um, need to be loved in return or not? And is there something noble about giving up that demand for requited love? Or can we, in fact, learn a lot more um, within a relationship where we, we um, struggle to have the other person love us rather than giving them up, renouncing them? Um, yeah. I don't know if that, that doesn't totally answer your question, but maybe the others want to jump in as well. I mean, I don't know that I have an answer, but all the the possibilities that you mentioned are, you know, that, that love is desire, that love is trust or devotion. Those are, you, you know, usually uh, in the philosophical literature, that's, those are the terms that people use. I mean, they talk about love either as desire or as, uh, as a kind of giving, as care or whatever. Um, I think probably different forms of love have different amounts uh, of the different ingredients. Um, you know, I would think that parents' love for children is more about giving, more about more of a kind of devotion, and the desire. If there is some kind of desire, then it's a desire to, you know, to to be close to the child, to be um, to be loved in return by the child, to be sort of to be around them, and so on. Uh, but it's a different kind of desire. Um, I still think that all the different even if your your love is all sort of about uh, giving, for example, if you're a, a parent and you really want to um, uh, take good care of your child and your child won't let you, then that can also be, uh, you know, it, it, that's also a form of uh, unrequited love that can also be very painful. Um, so it's not there, then it's not really about not being recognized in a certain way. It's about, um, well, maybe it's about, you know, that you, you have all this love that's somehow not valuable to another person. I wonder whether you might want to jump in here, Stephen, because I'm aware that we're kind of, there's a lot of psychoanalytic vocabulary being used. I'm hearing lack, desire, satisfaction. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to take one thing, the, the idea of parents and children, um, and can you hear me? Is it clear? Good. Um, I don't. I actually think it's a good thing that children are excluded sometimes. In fact, that's part of the motor for growing up and going into the world to love. If you have two parents that are in a couple and they love each other, and you're not abandoned by them when they're not with you, they have loved you and they've been loving parents. But there will always be this unrequited feeling. But that exclusion is, is you see it in people who don't have that sometimes, who've been um, you know, overly included. What happens is that there's a kind of motor, especially in adolescence, where children will come out of that thinking, well, I want what daddy has, or I want what mummy has. I want a, a man or a woman or somebody for myself. And that's an incredibly powerful uh, route into then going into the world and finding love. And actually, um, in that sense, I would think that, um, and I, it's, it probably reflects my background as a clinician, 
um, the people, when I think about unrequited love, I actually think, in a way, that's there from birth. Um, we're born into, it's almost Hegelian, but I would say a master-slave relationship. We're born into a world where we are very needy, full of desires, full of hunger, to someone who we would experience as hugely powerful, having everything. And um, we, these two wills will clash. And both want recognition. Both want to be acknowledged by the other and actually will only realize themselves if the other does recognize them. So they'll have to work out something about that. But we begin that way. And, in, and so to a certain degree, these issues of unrequited are there from all through our lives and will be played out in all of our love relationships um, where we will feel that to a certain degree. The people that I think of though, you know, I tend, in my book I talk about love sickness, which is just when you think of someone who has been so excluded and is so uh, upset with unrequited love that uh, actually the only thing which will cure them is the love of the beloved. Nothing else. That's what they have to have. And then it becomes quite interesting because I would say as a clinician that unrequited love or love sickness is actually a defense against love. In my experience like with patients, the ones that are coming who are stuck in a relationship where they're always in love with someone who does not reciprocating it, and that's all they will talk about in their <laughs> sessions, are actually using that to block a relationship not only with me, but with the world. And um, it's, uh, I give some examples of that in my book where it can go on for years with people, uh, where someone's had an affair with a married man and then he breaks it off, but they carry this on for years and are, their life is stopped. Or young people who are get caught up and they, they feel everything will be solved if this person loves me. Um, to me, and this may sound peculiar and I can explain my, the, the, the psychoanalytic thinking about it, that kind of love is not really love. As I said, it's a defense. It's actually closest to paranoia. And this may sound odd, but I can explain the thinking behind that. Um, and I write about this a bit in the book, but if you think about paranoia, um, well, there's an example I always like, which is in um, uh, it's the example of during the First World War, soldiers in the trenches uh, used to watch over at the other side, and they would see any kind of movement um, happening, maybe laundry being put out on a line or two cows taken into a field, normal life was going on. And they would take this at the French soldiers on the French side, believed that people on their side were signaling to the Germans where they were. They took everything as signs of, uh, what that showed to me was when people really feel threatened, uh, they would rather feel betrayed than forgotten. The, the roots of paranoia are in our own lives, too, in any moment where you have a, a thought which might be thought paranoid. In the book, I give an example of a patient of mine who comes home. She's been away for work. She comes in. She turns the lock in the door, and she has this fantasy for a moment of being blown up, that there are terrorists have somehow come in. And what is interesting about the fantasy is, as we unpick it, what she's really frightened about is being forgotten. Like those soldiers in the First World War, it's much better to be betrayed than to be forgotten. That being betrayed or hated even, you're in someone's mind. But it's much more a kind of psychological pain to think, no one thinks about me, no one loves me, no one cares for me. So paranoia in a way is a defense to me, and I talk about as the catastrophe of indifference. But the worst thing that can happen to us as people is to feel no, we're not in anyone's mind. And lovesickness is related to that. If you think about it, someone is going around all the time in the grip of this other person. And in a way, what they're doing is giving to that other person what they wish was being done 
to them. Their mind is completely filled in a way, and it's saying, um, you know, it's imagining and living a kind of hope that that person will be thinking, loving, or will one day love as they are loving. So it's a kind of, I see it as the other side of the coin about paranoia. I guess, I mean, it's, those are really the, the two big points that I wanted to make was that it, to me so often clinically, when, when also it stops the analysis dead. Um, when someone comes in and they're really in the grip of uh, a kind of attachment to someone who's unattainable, there's also, I think we'd all know too, and we can all sense sometimes there's an immaturity about it, uh, that there's something not quite right. And most analysts would talk about, and it's usually you see this in those patients too, you know, Winnicott would talk about the capacity for concern or Michael Ballant talked about, um, sounds funny, like kind of realistic idealization of the object that you, 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 you admire them, but it's realistic, not that they're going to solve everything. Um, but also that you're capable of um, empathy, sympathy with the person you love uh, as being a more mature form of love and being able to sort of test it out then. If, you, if it isn't reciprocated, to kind of try and th think about why. And that would be the philosophical thing that hopefully in analysis you can use that at that moment to try and get a crack and then start thinking with the person about why they would rather be in this suffering. And sometimes you discover, for example, that this suffering is awful and terrible, but it feels safe. It's much safer than surrender to someone who is available. And so it's a but that can take a lot of work to get there. And when someone's really fixed, I think, um, on, and, and that's a kind of love sickness where they really believe this, only this person will solve their pain, uh, it, it, it's difficult, if not impossible, to shift that. Um, but maybe I should stop there. Thank you. Um, so you seem to be saying that some people get attached to their suffering in particular ways and that this seems to be an example of um, people getting attached to a certain kind of suffering. It, it can be and we all know this too because anxiety for example, fears that we get and we can even sometimes rationally see from the outside we shouldn't have this fear. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I do think that love thing is sometimes where people are there, it is, and especially if you think about it in this way of it having a long history back into childhood, um, it can be uh, painful and awful, but as I said, familiar and safe. And the other place that you would have to move to of making yourself available to be rejected properly or to even love someone and get closer and closer. It, the, the view that I'm giving is that um, it's a way, if you think of two people meeting, they might over time get closer and closer. But actually, um, lovesickness is staying stuck at a very particular point. And so it's actually, um, you know, if it can't be used philosophically, or it, it, it's a way of freezing um, that kind of movement towards uh, emotional surrender or proper love, you know, b b between two people. Mm. That's why I would tend, to, as I said, to see it as a defense against love, not really love itself. Right, so actual love requires some kind of emotional surrender which is not a necessary part of us. Yes, I mean, it's all, I'm also making a distinction. In my book I put um, uh, with the poet Wendy Cope who talks about that this thing that we're talking about is a sort of exciting, fun bit, the sexy part at the very beginning when the walls come down and there's an incredible excitement um, and wanting that to continue to, or to have that feeling. And then she says, oh, that's, you know, real love is the bit which comes after that. When you like the Stanley Cavall thing of being where you, 
where you've been rejected or, or, or you fall out of love with someone. Um, you know, where you, um, we were talking about this before, I was making the point, which I very much believe that great marriages are remarriages in the sense that you psychologically divorce. Sometimes you just hate the other person and they hate you. And then you have to work through to a point where you think, well, actually, I'm not a very good person in some ways. They're right to hate me. And, they, and the other person's working through and thinking, yeah, I'm not that great either. How remarkable that this person loved me in the first place. And gosh, you know, and I loved them. And you know, that wasn't so bad. And you all of a sudden are remarrying. And you're going through a whole different thing. That's very different than the stuckness of unrequited love. So it seems like unrequited love is, is kind of a tool in some way to help us understand what love is, or what different types of love are. Um, I wonder if either of you would like to pick up on that. What, what it is that unrequited love teaches us about love more generally, I suppose. Or real love, or whatever we <laughs> want to call it. Um, well, I'll bite at that. So, um, yeah, within the context of, of, um, of remarriage, uh, so this, this is an idea, if you're interested in it, um, Stanley Cavell is a wonderful American philosopher, um, and he writes about these uh, films, Hollywood films from the 1930s and 40s, um, which have this trope of couples divorcing, getting remarried. So uh, often Catherine Hepburn is um, you know, sort of the feisty, independent woman, um, and uh, Spencer Tracy is in several of these as well. And um, yeah, just exactly the dynamic that, um, that you described. And for me, uh, thinking about unrequited love, it, it got me thinking about these comedies of remarriage, because in a way, um, unrequited love, because it has this um, propensity to, to kind of um, idealize the other person and project um, onto them, you, in a way, it, it kind of, uh, it's not as demanding um, as facing a concrete other every day in the morning when you're trying to get breakfast ready or take care of your almost two-year-old or whatever. I've got my lovely husband here in the room today. Um, <laughs> and uh, this, the, that the, the challenge um, maybe is to see uh, to recognize w with the person that you're facing in the everyday the challenge of repetition to kind of renew what love is and what love means and what that relationship is between the two of you, which isn't the same as mutuality. I think that maybe means too much that you're collapsing the other person into you or that their love is the same as yours. Um, because I really, I think loving is always um, incommensurate. The desire between two people is never going to match up. Um, but loving as a project that isn't just about um, projecting my own um, uh, sort of desires, wishes, fantasy, whatever, onto the other person. That that the the temptation to do that in unrequited love is almost um, impossible to resist. And I think it's hard even when you do face another person. But that other person is always recalcitrant in a way that the, the unrequited lover isn't. Uh, and I think that it's, that's really healthy. So for me, that kind of, um, that, the kind of psychological health that can come from that um, is, is worthier, I guess, than, than these other sorts of relationships. Stuckness. Yeah. I mean, those, those films, what's amazing was in the 19, I think it's the 1930s, there was a law passed, the Hayes Law, which basically they thought Hollywood was getting too risque and there was too much kissing and sex. And so they made a law that it could only happen within marriage. And so then the screenwriters who are all very clever came up with this idea of people will get them married and then we'll almost open the film with the divorce. <laughs> and then they can all flirt and do all sorts of things. And then we get them back together. So the Lady Eve, Philadelphia story, it happened one night, uh, His Girl Friday, yeah, Woman, the of most the Year, yeah. Woman of the Year. These are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful films. But I think what was brilliant about Stanley Cavell was he saw uh, there was a really deep psychological truth in those films. We love those films, I do, 
and they are wonderful and an incredible pleasure to watch. But part of the pleasure is they capture that real love is people hating each other, there's terrible fallout scenes in the beginning, and then how they work themselves back to s accepting that they're flawed, the other person accepting that she's flawed, and then this reconciliation that happens at the end of those films, which is actually real love, where the first bit, the couple that they thought they were, wasn't real. There was something not true um, that was part of the divorce. But I think, I'm, to me, they're very psychologically wise films. Uh, and that's part of why they give us so much happiness and pleasure. Um, okay, other, other questions then. I think we'll take two or three at once, and then um, and you can try to do you want to take the one to two at the back, and then one at the front? Um, this is a, a question for um, uh, Stephen Gross. Um, so thank you very much for your um, um, perspective. And I was uh, rather surprised that you used the uh, term paranoia, because throughout the, the talk, the Freud seminal paper on mourning and melancholia kept coming in and out of my brain. Um, and I was wondering whether you think, um, is unrequited love a form of eternal mourning? Is the melancholic state what's empty, the world or the ego? And my my second um, uh, question, if I may, is um, my impression is that analytically, unrequited love is very challenging. From your experience, what actually happens? What's the natural history of unrequited love? How does it transform in the therapeutic setting? Thank you. And that, there's another question. Just can I take that first, just because sure. it's complicated? Sure. There's, that's a very, very good question. The, you're absolutely right. Unrequited love is linked to mourning and melancholia. And the way it is, is that, and you'll, again, you'll recognize this in unrequited love. I always think of unrequited love also as a kind of nostalgia. It's a form of wishing for something from the past that, that's hard to, to have again. But it has in it the same thing that you get in that depressive grieving, which is grievance. If you think of what the, un, the person in unrequited love is saying, is they're thinking, if only he would do this, if only he would love me, if only, and that, that quality is a going over the past in the same way that you get in, in melancholia, where someone, and so it's unreal, um, because we can't go back, and, but it, it's, it's a wishing to return, and if, if he would do that one thing, then everything would be as it once was, as it should be. So it does have that aspect of it. Uh, the second part of your question about what happens clinically is, I, 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 as I said, I, mean, I, I think it just stops therapy dead. Because, um, uh, as, as by the way, love can sometimes too. When a patient's utterly gripped with something in that stage, and it's not uncommon, clinically, when you begin therapy with someone, that they will fall in love with somebody outside, you know, well, at the start of their therapy, sometimes almost as a defense against the intimacy. And they will come every day and have someone to talk about in the room because they're frightened of being alone and talking about themselves. So it can be a problem, but it, that's also life, and you just think about it and try and think how, how to make sense of that. Okay, we'll take a couple more questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so my question kind of draws together um, something mentioned by both Aaron and Stephen, um, and it says on the increasingly topical complexity of artificial intelligence. So the idea that, like in the film she in popular culture, you've got the protagonist who falls in love with an artificial intelligence. And in one sense, that seems to be unrequited because the artificial intelligence isn't loving you back, but in a much sort of richer sense, doesn't seem to be unrequited love because you're not loving with the expectation of being loved back and you're not kind of surrendering yourself to risk in the kind of same way. Um, so I was, I was just wondering what the panel thought um, that kind of told us about the idea of unrequited love. Thanks. There's a question in the front. Um, I have a question about Tinder. 
technology, all right. Go on. Um, so a lot of what we discussed, I think, was based on the premise that uh, you know you have the desire and you have the sort of long-term let it play out and dream about the person and so on and then that's how you eventually maybe begin a relationship sort of you adore them and then they realize that you know they're fallible and so are you and you marry and produce babies um how does one do in a tinder age um when you can just swipe as soon as you realize that well that person doesn't love me back or is a bit unavailable and then you just um you know have other options so how, how does that work Thank you. So two very handily connected questions there. One on AI and one on Tinder. Okay. Who's game? <laughs> let, let me start with the first question. I think if you're referring to this, the movie she, uh, not she, her, right? It's important that it's her and not she because she's only an object and not a subject. Um, I think... Um, I mean, I think that that's in a way a good kind of uh, parody of some of the philosophical ideals of love that sort of, um, that, that idealize um, the, that idealize in a way love that's so unconditional that it doesn't want to be requited, that doesn't even care if, if the beloved is like a free autonomous uh, creature who can, who can actually have feelings and attitudes uh, towards someone else. Um, I think if, if, that, if the scenario presented there were realistic or is realistic, then it's all kind of trading on our, um, the fact that there will be parts of our minds that just can't fathom the fact that something that you know, sounds like a person isn't a person. Um, so it, there will be some kind of deception involved. Um, should I answer the other one, or should you, do you want to jump in on the AI? Do you want to answer the Tinder question? <laughs> the Tinder question? <laughs> I don't know what to say about Tinder. I mean, on the one hand, there's like more possibility for, um, for being uh, hurt and insulted. Uh, on the other hand, you know that it's based on a kind of shallow impression and that, you know, you shouldn't take it as seriously if, uh, um, but um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, there's something incredibly humiliating, I think, about even like presenting yourself as someone looking for someone on an online uh, uh, forum. Um, I know, like on OkCupid or on Tinder. Um, and that humiliation, uh, I mean, it's a kind of, it's somehow related to the, the fear of, of being rejected or the, the idea that, you know, um, I mean, in some sense, it exposes the same kind of vulnerability that, uh, that we all fear in, in not being loved in return or in not being, yeah, in being rejected. <laughs> um, I, I think it's really, the question about Tinder is very, very interesting, actually, and, and ac it's um, about all social media, um, about Instagram or Facebook or Tinder and the presentation of self, um, because what I think happens increasingly is um, we create a character online. We create... Um, uh, well, as one patient of mine said, you know, online I'm really killing it. I'm having a fantastic, but my real life is, you know, rubbish. Um, so we have this kind of, but that's, a, it, that's quite an interesting thing because that used to be only a celebrity problem of a public profile. And then now what you have is a public profile and then a public private life, a, a public private self. And then you, but you also will always have a real private self. And so you have to create and maintain a boundary between your, your private self, who you are, and then you have this public self and public private self that you're putting into the world. Um, and I, I think that's actually um, rather complicated. And, you know, I think it's difficult for, to 
when you meet people to know if, if you're meeting their private self or their public private self and how do people now reveal their private selves to each other and, and so can you have relationships which I think a lot of the time happens on dinner which are just your public self and your public private self but that you're the more things the aspects of ourselves that uh, were important and who we are kept from other people um, in ways that may not have happened before like if you were having sex or an intimate relationship that would be more in involved which this may now keep away from, from the, but it's just a thought yeah. I will say that in Plato um, you're meant to move from the love of one beautiful body to the love of many beautiful bodies um, so, you know, bring it on, really. And then eventually to the love of souls and of knowledge and, yeah, beauty itself. We hope. <laughs> um, okay, should we take some more questions? I can see two in the middle. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for sort of opening up the space for this really emotive topic. It's really interesting. Um, it was more or less a question for all of you. I just wanted to, to sort of explore the relationship between I think you mentioned actually vulnerability and unrequited love and whether that is required in order to feel unrequited love and the sort of second question was about uh, something that Stephen mentioned about um, unrequited love being a defence against love. I found uh, what I was interested in was whether the person actually realises that, whether they can see that as a defence mechanism for why they feel unrequited love. Thank you. And could you pass the mic to the other one? Um, hi. I wanted to know if you think there are any similarities between the traditional and, and unrequited love to another person and a person's lack of love to themselves. Are, are there any similarities? And if the first is very resistant and very stubborn, then would that be also resistant? That would be a bigger problem if person, a person had lack of love to themselves and that was very resistant. And would you, would therapy be similar? Thank you. Okay, so question about vulnerability, question about unrequited love as a kind of defense against love, and a question about love of oneself, its relationship with unrequited love. What was the question about vulnerability? If you have to be vulnerable in order to experience unrequited love? I think almost kind of, I would say, is true by definition because uh, you would have no other way of conceiving of vulnerability other than, you know, the fact that you're capable of uh, of feeling hurt. Um, I think, I don't know. I maybe I've already answered the question because I spoke in the earlier on about the type of person who doesn't experience unrequited love. I guess there's a second type of person who, you know, has been rejected but doesn't take it so uh, seriously or doesn't dwell on it. Um, I guess that can, it can either be a sign that they're not vulnerable in a way that they're so self-sufficient that they don't really care what other people think about them and they're sure that they will, you know, meet somebody else. Uh, or it can be, as in this, um, I remember in the film uh, adaptation, there's a moment when one of the, um, one of the twins um, says that, you, you know, uh, uh, you are who you, uh, you are who you love, not who loves you. Or you are what you love, not what loves you. And so he had this feeling of kind of, um, you got the sense that he was that he was open to uh, to the other to other people. He wasn't like a, he wasn't a complete uh, you know arrogant jerk who didn't just didn't care if he was loved in return or not. But he had this very nice uh, way of kind of being resigned to it um, and not letting it. Uh, not not letting it sort of break him apart, not let it not let it uh, destroy his self-esteem. Um, 
so there was this kind of nice balance, I thought, of, of being open to other people without, without uh, leaving yourself, your self-esteem entirely up to, you know, what other people think about you. Uh, and the second question. Stop love. I mean, the question, your question about um, unrequited love and how that changes for someone. Um, in in my book, in the chapter on love sickness, I give a long. It's a long story about a woman who is really stuck for a very, very, very long time in um, a relationship to a married man who very quickly it becomes clear he's never going to leave his wife, never going to be available to her, she's never going to have a, and he only will appear to stir her up every once in a while. Um, and I tell the story, um, which I sometimes use with students, of a Christmas Carol of Scrooge, because I like the story very, very much. We think it's about Christmas. It's actually a fantastic story about psychological change, of course, because Scrooge begins that story as this very mean, uh, misanthropic person, but of course by the end of the story is full of gratitude and generosity and love. And part about how he's transformed is by the three ghosts of his past, present, and future come and visit him. And in a sense, I say that an analyst has to haunt their patient with their past, present, and future. And in the story, um, it's certain things happen to the person when we go up talk about our past and present. But in that story, I, I, I felt that one of the crucial turning points was when she saw a colleague of hers who she knew to have been in a similar situation, who was a bit older, and the unhappiness of her, that she was, it was like the ghost of her future. And she, that was one of the moments that helped to change. And it's, it's, it's sometimes not my words. When you think of therapy or analysis, all you have are words. But it was, I think, seeing that and thinking about it and that and being discussed, um, uh, something shifted. And then she was free. But to me, it, it is uh, not being scared, but it is really you have to kind of have a sense of those things, of, of being a bit haunted by the reality of who you are. And that, that can change that. OK, let's take another round of questions then. I think we've got time for maybe three more questions. We take the questions in the back row. Oh, maybe this one first and then the two in the back row. Um, so in the case of requited love, where someone does love you back, but they also love another person, um, why do you think people tend to see that as the same as unrequited love? Why do you think we have this idea that you can't love someone fully, truly, if you also love someone else? Thank you. Uh, I suppose a question on s along similar lines. Um, and it is, uh, to what extent is unrequited love sort of necessary to inspire reciprocal love? Thank you, and if you could pass the mic to the end. Thank you. Um, so I, I've just listened to this, um, and I keep thinking about unrequited love as a sort of frustrated need or desire from one person or some aspect of that person that's being unmet. And I'm just wondering in this world of internet and polyamorous relationships where you do perhaps have the chance to pick and choose aspects of love from different people um, and a sense of finding balance from different people and the kind of feeling of it takes a village to, to love and be loved. I'm wondering what you think about the idea of multiple sources to find that balance in the search of requiting that love and whether that's an immature approach or not, perhaps from Stephen's perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, just say it sounds very mature, actually. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that sounds quite thoughtful and grown up, in fact, of someone who realizes, you. you know, the person who may be wonderful reading a bedtime story to your child with you or cooking or 
may not be meet other needs that you have or it's very complicated between people and you know you may choose someone you know because you know it's sexually very exciting but why would they necessarily do all the things this went back to in the other question about two people and of course you actually you could love a number of people i don't think that that but it's the it's the other person it was the cruelty and the lack of sympathy of that it wasn't really i would say that the man that this woman was attached to really didn't care about her uh, and she knew that, i mean in fact um there was the the kind of cruelty about it was part of what it kept her involved was her self-hatred and there was a kind of feeling that was as i said earlier both familiar uh, it was safe but it was also something she felt she deserved she didn't feel and, and was also very anxious about a relationship where she would just be and this included by the way friendships with other people too uh, she was wary of so i don't know if that answers your question um i think if if one of the lessons we can learn from unrequited love is the you know the incommensurability um of of desire um whatever partnership you're in um then that can that could open the possibility that the person you love um, would love another person. And having kind of got to that recognition for yourself um, that the other person's de desire isn't your responsibility or something um, could perhaps make you OK with that, with that state of affairs um, in a way that you wouldn't be if you thought that love um, demanded a kind of possession of the other person or um, because I think that's the model of unrequited love insofar as it's philosophically useful is, is, is certainly about um, giving up any kind of possessiveness or any kind of um, expectation uh, in return. Um, but I would say that, uh, yeah, in uh, outside of the, the realm of philosophy, um, yeah, those relationships uh, are complicated because they require, you know, a degree of maturity and, um, you know, some of us just uh, just aren't that <laughs> developed. So I would c count myself in that number of undeveloped people. <laughs> there's one, I, I, I found there's one other point which I didn't make, which is, was that actually a very common thing that I see is two people who really love each other um, but can't be together because they want different things. So in that instance, that man both wanted to be married and very, and not spend much. But you know, he, what he wanted was not what the the person. You could say they both loved each other, but they clearly wanted very very different things for themselves. And that's uh, sometimes uh, the most painful relationships to end, where people love each other but have to say goodbye because. <coughs> they realize that the, the lives they want and the things they want to do in life are, are very different. No, I want to say something about lovesickness. So it's going back to an older topic. May I? Yes. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I want to say, um, you know, what I'm going to say is against medical advice. <laughs> um, I, uh, I had this experience once I'd, I'd gone to visit friends, they're a couple, and uh, as I was going back home, I suddenly had this sort of epiphany um, that, you know, I'm so happy that I'm single because, I mean, they had like a normal, like nice marriage, but it also meant that, you know, it was sort of uh, a little bit boring and they annoyed each other and it was all kind of very prosaic and wh when I was on my way home I, I, I suddenly realized you know so I'm you know I'm lonely and uh, I'm you know I'm alone and blah, blah blah but at least like I still have the dream about love whereas those two they know that this is this is it that they're not they're not they're, they can't keep dreaming about about love like this is the reality and so of course this is you know this is 
uh, a part of this kind of, um, in one way you could say it's part of this sort of lovesickness, uh, self-delusion or whatever, but I, I also think that the way in which we idealize love when we're alone, when we're not loved, um, is not only, I mean, it, it, so, so it might be false, but that doesn't mean that it's not healthy and helpful. Uh, because it's, it's something, I think, that can like, really keep us going, this dream about you know, the, per the perfect love. Um, and in the same way, um, being sort of hung up on someone who, that like, it's not gonna happen with them, uh, is also something that can kind of you know, keep you, um, uh, give you energy in some way, keep you motivated. Uh, as you move forward until you meet the next person to get hung up on that maybe it will work out with them. Um, and so I think, yeah, the, 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 the dream about love in general and maybe the, the, the dream about, you know, the love with a particular person that you're in love with who won't have you, um, even if they're uh, unrealistic, uh, can be can be uh, a good thing. Can be a, that it can be a help. I think it can be a, to, to a certain extent a healthy kind of um, uh, form of of of, uh, of self protection um, of defense. Uh, just as you know, more generally, this came up in in what Stephen was saying. Uh, you know, sadness. Is, I mean, self-pity is one of the most pleasant feelings that there are. It's a form of temporary happiness. And in the same way, sadness can be an incredibly soothing uh, feeling. It's a f because most, most of all, I think, because it, sadness keeps anxiety at bay. And anxiety is much worse than sadness. Uh, and so often what happens, I think, when you go to uh, a therapist is they try to make you see the possibilities. You know, you're so close, you're kind of have tunnel vision, you think that like everything is over and so on. Um, and it's the reason you feel that way is because, because possibility makes you feel anxious and to feel kind of resigned to your fate and sad about it is pleasant and I understand that it can be very unproductive but to, some, to a certain extent I think it's a, a, a kind of intelligent form of, of uh, of healing and protection that the you know our our psyches kind of uh, are that that's built into our psyches in a way. Okay, I think that's Sorry, a, good, a good, good place, place to, to finish. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Arika. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, join me in thanking our speakers.